Thank you, Brother Wiseman. My brothers and sisters, I'm very happy to be here tonight. I was in Bakersfield last night in Thousand Oaks the night before, and I don't ordinarily travel on Sunday if I can avoid it, but I got back at 10 minutes after 3 in time for my son's homecoming from Belgium at 3.30, and I'm very happy to be here now. These are delightful times in the kingdom. I just thrill with the strength that is, has been rallied by the Lord in my lifetime. When I was uh, born into the church, there were 431,000 members of the church worldwide. We've added that many people to the church since 1971. All of these beautiful buildings that you see around the land, lovely steakhouses, chapels, temples, schools, practically all of these have been built since I was born, many of them uh, since our children were born. This is really the new era. President McKay pronounced it the new era in 1960. It had taken us 30 years to get 10,000 Latter-day Saints in Latin America. We got the next 10,000 in two years and the next 10,000 in one year, and now you see they're baptizing in some of those missions as many as 1,000 per month. Our son, however, came from one of the more difficult missions, Belgium and Holland, where they have um, contributed wonderful people to our church, but now a gleaning is taking place where a missionary is fortunate if he's, well, it averages about one half convert per missionary for two years. I don't know whether you've seen any half converts going around, but, uh, but that's about as well as they can do. And there's a tremendous resistance to it. Now, whenever that happens, the Lord has a way of humbling the people, usually by distress or war of some kind. I know if I had been aware when I was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in the streets of London, that within seven years there would be uh, V2 uh, bombs falling on those very streets. I would have preached uh, a little stronger, but I was only 17 when I went over there and I was just a little timid. So I gave them the message, but uh, with restraint. Uh, I would have given them the Jeremiah treatment had I just uh, known how close everything was. Well, things are moving now in a prophetic direction. And uh, the saints need to be aware of what's going to happen in order that they can prepare for what the prophets said they should prepare for. Our brethren have warned us about storing our food, getting out of debt, keeping um, things in pretty close control, <clears throat> sending our sons and daughters on missions where they're called, paying our tithes and offerings, doing the best we can to get our homes paid for, become as independent as we can, be very frugal about our investments, play them close, uh, don't get too far extended. All this kind of counsel has been given to us. And it's appropriate to remind ourselves that in this immediate future that's just out in front of us, we probably will have a test of those teachings. And we'll be very grateful to the Lord and his prophets if we listened and did what we were asked to do, and probably filled with considerable regret if we feel, if we find that like the foolish virgins, we waited too long to put the oil in our lamps. My talk tonight is with reference to something that is moving in on our great country that we were promised would never happen, but it is happening, and it's left our wisest men confused and uh, in some instances frightened. Uh, I lived through uh, a crisis of this kind myself, and I remember those great men, how they panicked when it got out of their control. Now some things are happening today that could get out of their control. And if it does, the elders of Israel are in a position to make a tremendous contribution if they're prepared. And that's what my talk is all about tonight. We're not yet prepared. We've got a great vacuum in our priesthood culture. And so I want to talk about it just a little bit tonight. Um, about a year and a half ago, one of our scholars going through the records of the church historian's office came through a penciled 
outline of the prophet's speech given in 1840, which everybody had been looking for and had given up as being lost. Uh, people remembered the talk and they remembered the prophecy contained in it, but they didn't remember exactly what uh, he had said or how he had said it. Uh, so we finally have the prophecy of, of Joseph Smith on what would happen to our Constitution. Now I know you're all familiar with it and have, have heard it cited, but it's great to have it now in its actual wording so that we know what he said. Now it appeared in the May issue of the New Era and it's on page 19 for those of you who uh, have access to it. It turned out to be just a single sentence. The prophet didn't say the Constitution would hang by a thread. Neither did he say that the nation would be destroyed. What he actually said was, and this very nation shall approach the brink of destruction, and the Constitution will be on the brink of ruin, and the nation will turn to this people and lean upon them as a staff and this people will bear the Constitution away from the brink of destruction. Now this tells me several things. The people that have thought that the Constitution was old-fashioned and obsolete have been up to bat now for quite a long time. And they've made a lot of promises which they, I, they sincerely thought were possible. And they followed certain economists from England and elsewhere that promised it was possible. There were political science, science specialists who said it was possible. The fact that the Lord said it wasn't, the fact that the Founding Fathers said it wasn't, the fact that the living prophets today said it wasn't possible was ignored. But they are finding that their promises are unfulfilled and a billion dollar patch on top of a billion dollar patch is not succeeding. And so they're all of a sudden greatly concerned as they find the great balloon of promises suddenly deflating as it has done hundreds of times when it's been tried before. The lessons of history were very apparent as J. Reuben Clark used to say. Don't deceive yourselves with these false promises. We know enough about what the results will be. But anyway, self-deception is, is a narcotic that is very hard to cure people of. And um, now we've followed a course. I'm so grateful to our Heavenly Father and for living prophets because I know that if we prepare ourselves, we could lead this nation back under the Constitution, away from the brink of destruction, and even though we had a temporary period of some difficulty perhaps and sacrifice, there would be stability again. Now the founders went through this experience. I want to read to you a few of the words of, of, of one of the greatest men that certainly ever lived in this country as he describes what it was like to be the most famous man in the United States at the time when the United States was falling apart and he could do nothing about it until the people were willing to have something done about it. Washington came out of the Revolutionary War a success uh, how they won it was, it was a miracle. Nobody won in that war. It was a worldwide war. A lot of people have forgotten this. Spain was in it. France was in it. England was in it. They fought it in many places beside the United States. But only one country came out with a gain, and that was the United States. And they got one half of the continent from the uh, Mississippi all the way over to the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, it just seemed like everything should have been fine, but it wasn't. The dollar went down to two cents. The government wouldn't even accept the continental dollar to pay taxes. Uh, states began to divide up. They took um, special care to prevent any of their goods from being sold in another state without the export having a heavy tax on it. Imports had heavy taxes on it. Each state tried to isolate itself as a, an independent country. It became so bad that um, New England decided to form a separate nation. And then the middle states said, well, we'll form a separate nation. The southern states said, then we'll form a separate nation. Then the Civil War broke out. The army attacked Congress in Philadelphia and they had to, to run. The, the Congress actually deserted the capital of the United States when the army attacked them 
to demand that they be paid in gold, not two cent continental dollars for fighting the war. Then they began to have riots up in Massachusetts where they were forcing the farmers to pay taxes so heavily uh, that uh, first of all they took their land away from them, then they put them in debtor's prison, and then when they rebelled, and some of them would gang up around the courthouse so the judge couldn't get in, you know, they'd all stand there shoulder to shoulder, and the judge would come up and say, one side please, court must meet, court. and you'd have these Yankees say, I'm sorry, sir, I can't move, as you can see, can't move. And uh, so they couldn't hold court. And uh, finally, uh, <clears throat> they decided to hold court and declare these people guilty of treason, penalty being death. And that was the Shays Rebellion, that you'll remember. And about uh, quite a number of them were sentenced to death as a result of that, though subsequently commuted. Now that was the situation just before the Constitution was adopted. This country was in absolute chaos and on the verge of splitting apart. Listen to Washington. He's talking now, this is um, uh, 1785, a year and a half here before the Constitutional Convention. The wheels of government are clogged, he wrote to James Warren. We are descending into the veil of confusion and utter darkness. Then on August the 1st, the following year, he said, Your sentiments, and he's writing now to John Jay, later appointed the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He said, Your sentiments that our affairs are drawing rapidly to a crisis accord with my own. What then is to be done? Would to God that wise measures may be taken in time to avert the consequences we have but too much reason to apprehend. Then in November, a month later, he said, No day was ever more clouded than the present. We are fast verging to anarchy and confusion. How melancholy is the reflection. What stronger evidence can be given of the want of energy in our government than these disorders? A liberal and energetic constitution, well guarded and closely watched to prevent encroachments, might restore us. Then December the 26th, 1786, and you see they're going to meet in the convention the following May, he writes to General Henry Knox, that great big fellow weighed about 300 pounds that he sent over to Ticonderoga to get those 59 cannons that uh, Washington mounted uh, uh, there up above Boston and so frightened the British they just pulled out. You remember that one? Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, <clears throat> he writes to Henry Knox, he says, I feel my dear General Knox infinitely more than I can express to you for the disorders which have arisen in these states. Who could have foreseen or predicted them? And then February the 3rd, just a couple of months, his um, brother has just died, his mother's about to die, his sister's on her deathbed, it looks like. Uh, Washington is so suffering from rheumatism and gout that he has to carry one arm in a sling. And he's just about to be called to represent Virginia at the Constitutional Convention. And he writes, If any person had told me that there would have been such formidable rebellion as exists, I would have thought him a Bedlamite, a fit subject for a madhouse. Well, within two months, you see, he's, he arrives in Philadelphia. His mouth hurts. He's wearing some um, wooden teeth trying to masticate the food. He's an old man, he's 55. <laughs> he has suffered in the field so much that uh, he begins to uh, feel all the impact of the pains and aches. He doesn't know he's got many years of service yet, but he does it out of a sense of duty. And because of the illness of his mother and his sister and his brother just having died, he, he almost um, used that excuse. And then he said, no, if I don't go, they'll think I've lost con confidence in the federal Congress and that there's no hope anymore and there'll be some more of that trying to get me to be king and it'll turn everything backwards. I will be there. He didn't speak at the convention except once, but he presided. He was the chairman. And you couldn't have had a more dignified, splendid person. Well, they worked on that Constitution for three months. The, the story of the Constitutional Convention is exciting. We, we cover this in our constitutional seminars that we're teaching. And uh, just to see how it worked out, because uh, the Lord would give a man inspiration, the spark of inspiration would strike this man, and most of the others would be against it. And they would argue and argue and argue and argue and argue and argue until they'd say, oh, I guess that's it. 
Yeah, it's, it's a most interesting thing. I hear some people say, well, you know, the Constitution was just a conglomerate of compromise. No, that Washington saw what was happening. He afterwards described it. He said, I saw the spark of inspiration that none of us could recognize at first. And as we discussed it, a spirit of inspiration came over us until we reached consensus. There were three or four very serious compromises where a person gives up what he wishes he didn't have to give up and another man gives up what he wishes he didn't have to give up in order to move forward. There were some of those, but most of it was by consensus. And any of you who have watched uh, any of the general authorities functioning have watched that same spirit work. There's a presentation, discussion, sometimes some opposition, and it's discussed and discussed and discussed consensus and the Spirit will confirm it. I saw that on one occasion when I was asked to take the tabernacle broadcasts and I, I already was holding down what turned out to be five full-time jobs later at BYU and um, when I received the call signed by the First Presidency I was panicked almost because I was swamped and they were asking me to um, do something that I knew I couldn't do unless they let me do what I prepared myself to do. This is a very sacred experience, and I'll just share it with you tonight. I went up before the missionary committee, about five members of the Quorum of the Twelve, the members of the Council of Seventy, and um, Brother Gordon Hinckley's secretary at that time, not a general authority. So they said I was to give 13 broadcasts, and they said, um, have you um, an outline? And I said, yes. They said, would you um, present to us what you'd like to do? So I presented to them what I could do and not neglect everything else I was doing. And so Brother Joseph Fielding Smith said, well, that's fine. That's a new approach, and I think that would be very helpful. I'd like to hear it from that point of view. And, of course, it's always the same wonderful story of the gospel, but from a different point of view, called Challenge of Our Times. And... Uh, he said, now let's hear from each of you. He went around the circle until it came to one of the apostles. And one of the apostles said, I, I would like to see Brother Skousen do something different. And he suggested just, the, just what I couldn't do without a tremendous amount of time for research. I couldn't do it justice. So I sat there saying my prayers and it went to the next man and he sort of sided with that a little bit and, and it went on around, came to another apostle and he said, definitely, I'd like to see it done that way. And so it went back to Brother Joseph Fielding and they were all late for their next meeting. I was getting a little nervous and I thought that was going to be it and Brother Joseph Fielding said, well, brethren, we don't have our answer yet. We'll go around again. So it started around again, and he got to this first apostle, and to my great relief, he shifted back about 35 degrees. It was still impossible for me to do it, but it was closer to home. And the next apostle said, well, I would, I would concur in that, I guess. And it sort of went on around until he got to the second apostle, and he concurred too. And that's when it happened. It was the most beautiful feeling of satisfaction, confidence, well-being. I guess it's the word euphoria. I guess that's the way we describe it. I knew something tremendous was happening and I tried to analyze it. I almost felt weightless. I felt so warm. I just knew that whatever was to be done, it could be done. No doubt about it, it could be done. And it was so impressive to me that I looked around at the others and the brethren were all looking down at the table. Everyone was very quiet. And it seemed like a long time to me. But as it got back, Brother Joseph Fielding was chairman, and I watched him, and pretty soon he lifted his head and said, Well, brethren, we have our answer, Brother Skousen. Go right ahead. It'll work out just fine. You go right ahead. Right ahead. And I knew it was going to work out. I didn't know how. But I just felt confident it would work out. And as we were walking down the hall, I said, Brother Hinckley, did you feel that? He said, is that new to you? <laughs> and, and I said, well, I've never felt it quite like that before. Well, he said, that's what you call waiting on the Lord. And you're going to do all right. Don't worry. You're going to get all the help you need. And I said, Gordon, I feel like I will somehow. We will be able to do it. So we went back and we didn't have, we didn't handle 13 broadcasts, we handled 26. 
And um, they were subsequently published in a little book that's no longer available called Challenge of Our Times. Now that's how I learned about consensus. Where inspired men work over something until the Spirit of the Lord can say, that's it. And when the Spirit says that, you just know that it's going to be all right. And it was. And Brother Richard L. Evans and I worked sometimes at 4 o'clock in the morning to get those broadcasts done, but they were done. And um, that's the way the Founding Fathers wrote the Constitution. Joseph Smith tried to explain to the brethren what it's like to let pure intelligence pour into you so you recognize the Spirit of the Lord when it's working in you. In you. As I say to my students in our Book of Mormon classes, you open that precious book and you put your hand on it and you thank your Heavenly Father that He's prepared this book after nearly 4,000 years. Part of that book was being written 4,000 years ago among the Jaredites, and we've got it now. Just thank him for it. Then open your workbook that we provide and start working and watch the Spirit working in you. And I promise you that if you'll be prayerful, live a righteous life and study this book, the Spirit of the Lord will eventually fill you so full that it will overflow the dikes of your eyes and you will cry. And when you cry, it will be because you're so happy and you must recognize what's happening. Get on your knees immediately and thank your Heavenly Father for actually sharing a direct communication from across the veil with you because that's what's happening to you. Well, the Prophet Joseph tried to instruct us on how to recognize the Spirit. The Founding Fathers may not have known what was happening except that they would start out with James Wilson saying, we want a strong single president. And you have Governor uh, Randolph jumping up, uh, uh, representing uh, uh, Virginia and saying, a strong single president, shades of King George. <laughs> what we want are three presidents, one for New England, one for the Middle States, and one for the Southern States. And Wilson jumps up again and he says, haven't you heard of the 30 tyrants of Greece? They collaborated. <laughs> he said, it doesn't, it's, there's no safety in numbers, and you must be able to fix responsibility. I say one strong president operating within a framework of limitation. The other said, no, 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 no. In fact, one from Connecticut said, all we want is a clerk. <laughs> New England, a pronunciation of clerk. <laughs> to carry out the will of the, the Congress. That's all, we don't want a president at all. <laughs> well, they discussed it and discussed it. No, 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 and all of a sudden they said, all right, I, 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 that's right. That's the way they did the Constitution. And on the next point, Wilson didn't get the spark of inspiration. It came over on another person. He resisted it. And he finally gave in, and you got it over there. Now that's what's exciting about the Constitution. When it was all finished, our Heavenly Father was able to say that they had found the golden mean on the political spectrum. Enough government to maintain order and not enough government to abuse the people. And he said anything that's more or less than this is evil. That's the greatest compliment the Founding Fathers could have had. Section 101 of the Doctrine and Covenants and also in Section 98 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Well, when that Constitution was finished, it's just a piece of paper with writing on it that everybody agrees they will subscribe to. Now listen to Washington right after he was elected president. Within a year, this is the way he's talking. Writing to Lafayette, his old friend from Valley Forge. And he says, my dear Marquis, you have doubtlessly been informed from time to time of the happy progress of our affairs. The principal difficulties seem to a great measure to have been surmounted. Our revenues have been considerably more productive than it was imagined they could be. And I mentioned this to show the spirit of enterprise that prevails. And just a, a few months later, he said, our country, my dear sir, writing to Lafayette, and it truly is ours or, or yours both of us, is fast progressing in its political importance and social happiness. And then he wrote to Catherine Macaulay Graham uh, a month later, the United States enjoys a scene of prosperity and tranquility under the new government that could hardly have been hoped for. And uh, a couple of days later he wrote to David Humphrey, tranquility reigns among this people with that disposition toward the general government which is likely to preserve it. Our public credit stands on that high ground which three years ago it would have been considered as a species of madness to have foretold. 
Three years before, the nation was bankrupt, and by following certain principles, they were able to restore confidence in the whole fiscal arrangement. In fact, within three years, the nation was on its way, strong, firm, self-confident, all because of a piece of paper with the right principles on it and the support of the people back of those principles. That's what they could do in three years. Now, as Brother Benson said not so long ago, with the right leadership and the right support, the whole trend, not only in the United States but in the world, could be reversed in three months. It isn't that complicated. What's complicated is um, <laughs> doing what uh, President Clark said they keep doing. He said, these people that keep trying to remedy our ills remind me of a doctor who's been called in to, uh, to, to um, take care of a patient with a very bad case of smallpox. And he goes to the house and gets in bed with the patient. <laughs> he said, this is what we're doing. He said, uh, Europe has found uh, by following socialism They've gotten into all kinds of trouble. We've had to give them billions of dollars to help them out. They had the best of intentions. They were going to have the perfect welfare state, and who is, who's against social welfare? But he said, now uh, they're in such trouble, we're following the same general direction, and who will bail us out? All right. We've reached a point now where a lot of people are beginning to awaken. And the thing that thrills me about it, nobody talks about which party is right and which party is wrong. People have reached a point where they start, they're talking principle again, and that's what's important. The Latter-day Saints can unite on principle. Um, every once in a while I hear somebody say, well, we must maintain party unity. And my answer to that is, no, you must obtain and maintain unity on principle. Not people, not party. Loyalty must be to principle, and then we can succeed. Well, it's kind of thrilling to see what Washington was able to say after just a couple or three years of constitutional government. And immediately people started tearing it apart. And they began gnawing on it immediately. As a matter, in the very first Congress, they had a big debate over what the General Welfare Clause meant. And Madison and Jefferson tried to explain to some of the others who didn't attend all the meetings. That happens, you know. <clears throat> what the Founding Fathers really intended, that they had stipulated the areas in which the federal government could function, and they had said that as they taxed and exercised their power in those specific areas, they had to do it in a way that was for the general welfare. You couldn't do it for one state or one person, always had to be for everybody. That's what the General Welfare Clause meant until 1936 when it was reversed and Justice Roberts says, no, we think that was a grant of power. And they quoted Hamilton. Why, even Hamilton had said, what's the good of specifying certain things the federal government can do and that alone, and then turning around and saying the federal government can appropriate money for anything that's nice. And that's the way it was ruled. As a result of that, some things have been happening that I just want to refer briefly to because it's in all the headlines of the paper. We feel sorry for New York, but New York didn't want us to feel sorry for them. They had a good thing going until this year when the bank said, no more. And all of a sudden, we found it wasn't New York's problem. It was the state of New York's problem. And the next thing we knew, all the bankers in Salt Lake say, and it certainly is Utah's problem. If they go down, we are in real trouble. And so all of a sudden, if you've been reading your local press, you'll notice that some things have been happening that the Founding Fathers and the Living Prophets said you mustn't do. Here's what happened. The New York City decided that the poor, the New York City described itself as a city with a heart. They decided that the poor should have sufficient welfare to live in dignity. Now, are you opposed to that? They want the poor to live in dignity. Are you poor? Then here it is. Be dignified. They decided that everyone in New York was entitled to a good education and should not have to pay for it, whether they were able to or not. So one of the largest universities in the country was established with free tuition and the highest paid professors in America. They decided that everyone should have health care at below cost prices. 
So they established 19 hospitals and subsidized large deficits from each hospital. They decided that the city employees should be the best paid in the country and should also have the most generous pensions so they could retire in dignity. So they yielded to the demands that were made to them with very little resistance whether they had the money or not. They decided to help poor people hold down costs by putting rent controls on property within the city. All of these policies were the kind which flow from a kind heart mixed with um, a little political philosophy that the New York politicians employed, which was spend, 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 elect, elect, elect. And you can do that until the next generation's inheritance is gone. And then there's trouble, there's trouble. All these kind acts created gigantic deficits in New York budget. New York decided to solve its fiscal problems by borrowing. First, they increased the property tax to such levels that the property owners squeezed by rent controls on top and increasing costs and taxes from the bottom just simply abandoned their buildings and refused to pay the taxes and said, take them. And this deprived New York of a lot of the revenue it was expecting and whole sections of New York were abandoned. They then resorted to the simple device of borrowing to cover their deficits with short-term loans. And when they became due, they would borrow from another bank to pay that bank. And this got to be kind of a routine. Now, do you think you could get away with that? Oh. Well, in a few months ago, as New York routinely went to the banks to fund some more current deficits and to roll over some of its short-term obligations, the banks began asking embarrassing questions. You see, banks under the law are required to invest their capital prudently. Banks have bought New York paper with their own capital, which should stand as the bank's ultimate guarantee against defaulting loans or financial losses. They had also invested trust funds through their trust departments with the city. And suddenly they realized that the city was incapable of paying back its debts. And so they refused any further loans. And that's what created the crisis. Now it has been temporarily averted, but let me just read to you what New York has to pay. In December they pay $798 million. That's what's due. In January they have to pay $1,364,000,000. But only $638 million in February. 863 million in March, 207 million in April, and so it goes. Now, but New York has a kind heart. Now this was exactly what the prophet, the living prophet, warned the people against over and over. Let me just see if I can put my hands on that little quote. If I can't just put my finger on it, you'll all remember that he said that one of the most serious problems that can face a nation is when it decides to um, use charity to people and the power of the government to tax in order to do nice things for people. So he says, we again warn our people in America of the constantly increasing threat against our inspired constitution and our free institutions set up under it. The same political tenets and philosophies that have brought war and terror in other parts of the world are at work amongst us in America. The proponents thereof are seeking to undermine our own form of government and to set up instead one of the forms of dictatorships now flourishing in other lands. These revolutionists are using a technique that is as old as the human race, a fervid but false solicitude for the unfortunate over whom they thus gain mastery and then enslave them. And because that had been used in Europe over and over again, it's kind of interesting what the results have been. As each time I go to Europe, I hear such, such complaints from the British about their national health plan, the very thing we're now considering, backed by the uh, amazing people that ought to know better. I, I get the same thing in Sweden. And I say, well, then why don't you abolish it? Why don't you change it? And they say, well, but it's free. <laughs> I said, here you're paying 58% taxes and it's free? Well. In the U.S. News and World Report, 
Here was a recent, uh, 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 not recent, but uh, a summary report of what it did to Sweden. After 20 years of building the world's greatest welfare state, Sweden finds most of the original problems unsolved, and in some cases grown greater instead of fading away. The costly welfare and educational reforms have not curbed such social ills as crime, alcoholism, and drug addiction. Sweden's crime rate has doubled since 1950, with juvenile crime largely responsible. Now you hear this comment from a high police official. It has become increasingly clear over the past 10 years that the welfare state we live in is anything but an ideal society. Housing subsidies are one of the achievements of which the social planners are most proud. Yet housing today is one of the worst of the situations in Sweden. Young married couples often are forced to live with relatives. Many face a wait of 10 years before they can have homes of their own. That means a one-room apartment. When we were over there, that's what the young people said. I have to live with mom and dad for about 10 years to get a one-room apartment. I said, but look at those beautiful forests. You've got enough forests up there to build a house for everybody in Sweden. You've only got four million people. There's woods right there. Oh, it's against the law. You can't do that. Uh, I said to the mission president, uh, I see you've been redecorating the mission home. He said, yes. Uh, I said, what happened to the stairway here? Um, it was all in a rough and no wallpaper, plaster only half done. He said, well, we ran out of our uh, manpower allotment. And I said, uh, what do you mean your manpower? Well, they allowed a certain amount of manpower to do our redecorating. And I told them to hurry, but they didn't, and we ran out. And now I have to wait for a year. And I said, well, for heaven's sakes, I, I know a little bit about plastering. Let's get busy. Uh oh he said, you'd go to jail. You can't finish that job. Well. See, our people don't realize that that's, that's the amount of control that goes with these things once you accept it. Workers in the lower and middle income brackets pay taxes twice as much as Americans in the same brackets. That, this was a few years ago. In this welfare state, <laughs> wages and salaries have risen even faster than prices, but higher taxes have swallowed most of the gains in pay. Wage inflation now is beginning to undermine the competitive position of some industries. And so it goes on. Yeah, the same thing happened in Saskatchewan where they tried it. And uh, our prophets just told us it wouldn't work. But they said, are you against the poor? Are you against the aged? No, the prophet said. I'm against deception. These things are false promises. He said it's a fervid but false solicitude for the unfortunate. Now he said there are plans that will help the poor and help the aged and give them an old age retirement. Not $125 a month. That amount of savings over a lifetime should be giving every recipient of a real retirement program at least $1,000 a month. And you could take a trip to the Holy Land or something, you see. <laughs> you should be getting $1,000 a month at least with that much saving. And so this is what the, what the brethren tried to warn our nation about. But both major political parties backed the system. It didn't allow any room at all for private investment or private programs uh, of um, substantive nature. And, well, that's another story, and that's only preliminary, really, to what I wanted to share with you tonight. Because we have a statement in the second verse of section 134 of the Doctrine and Covenants that we do not believe in what New York has been doing, nor what the federal government has been doing, but we have been electing people who have gone back to Washington or other places and have voted for these things we don't believe in. Because a lot of our people have never been taught we don't believe in it. <laughs> this is what the, the, the error. It's in a wonderful little speech. Uh, well, in fact, it's in a book by Bastiat called The Law of a considerable period of time. But uh, Brother Ezra Taft Benson has given a number of talks that have received just a wonderful reception called the proper role of government, in which he simply says this, that all of the early philosophers of government said, you can delegate to the government anything that you can do yourself. And uh, as Locke and others said, God gave you the right to multiply and replenish the earth. In fact, he gave you a command to multiply and beautify the earth. And that meant that what was yours was yours to cultivate, that was your stewardship, and, and under the blessings of God, you have a right not only to cultivate it and beautify it, but to protect it. He said, actually, this is what property is based upon, a God-given right. It's one of the unalienable rights that comes to people. And you are entitled to the fruits thereof, and 
all of the things that you can do with it. Now, supposing you work really hard and you get a little more than the man next to you. And you say, now, he needs a little help, a little advice, so I'll just go over him and share some of this with him and I'll show him how to do it better. Now, is that legitimate? Is that legitimate? All right, we say it is. Now, there's a fellow over there standing there and he sees that I have more than my neighbor. And so he comes over and takes some of mine and gives it to my neighbor and says, be happy. <laughs> now, is that right? You, you think I'm going to feel unhappy about that? All right. That is so basic. That's like two plus two equals four. No one should have any trouble with Bastiat and those who, uh, who understood principles of honest, legitimate, long-range, peaceful, prosperous government. government. We decide that we'll form a government so that we can have it taking care of any of our enemies coming from abroad. Uh, they'll, while we're farming and taking care of our affairs, they'll watch out for things over there. They'll make arrangements with other countries, etc. So that's nice. So we set up a government. All of a sudden, my two neighbors gang up, this one over here that's so good-hearted, you know, and this one that doesn't have any, and they say that they will give the government the authority to come and take my property and give to either or both. Now, is that right? Do they have the authority to delegate to the government something they can't do themselves, legally, morally? And Bastiat said, obviously not. And if you will keep government restricted to those activities which are prerogatives of individuals, you will have peace and justice. At the moment that you give government the powers of the Roman civil law to decide what is good for the masses and then force them to live under it, then the Constitution is dead. And that's the direction we've been moving. And people like J. Reuben Clark and David O. McKay and Ezra Taft Benson and some of these men that tried to speak a word in time, my generation ripped them to shreds in the quiet of their own homes as they would say my I wish brother Clark would stay out of politics remember that or they wouldn't attack brother McKay he was too sweet a person instead they would attack those that he whose teachings he recommended try to destroy the approach indirectly well it's beginning to come home so now it's time for us to sit down as brothers and sisters, especially my generation needs to do a lot of repenting. And we need to sit down and say, all right, we must mend the fences as fast as we can, as effectively as we can, for the sake of the next generation. And if we will do this in time, we'll have the privilege of helping to fulfill Joseph Smith's great prophecy of what could happen. Now, what did he say would happen? that these people that have these artificial, superficial plans will continue to the point where the American people will say in disgust, no more, as President McKay told several of us in 1960, history will catch up with them. We must be prepared at that time to be able to take the initiative when it's offered to the saints. Secondly, it says that the people will turn the nation will turn to this people, lean upon them as a staff, and this people will bear the Constitution away from the brink of ruin. Now, I ask you, you ready for this assignment? What's your answer for um, an, the unstable dollar? Have you figured that out yet? What are you going to do with a private uh, uh, banking system which functions in the name of the government to raise and lower interest rates, maintain control of the flow of money, which is control of inflation, which uses government money for the purpose of making investments by, by legal right. Our banking system is operating in direct violation of Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution. But in any event, what is the answer? What are you going to do about the Interstate Commerce Commission which was demanded by the people to keep railroad rates reasonable. And the Interstate Commerce Commission, with the best of intentions, has regulated practically every railroad in the United States into bankruptcy. You think something might have been wrong there? 
Then as I say to our students in our constitutional seminars, where did they get off the track? They meant well, where did they get off the constitutional track? You know what thrills me? Once you've studied the Constitution, you can say right there. And all of that was unconstitutional. Right. So if you want to get it straightened out, you know how much to phase out. Come back within the framework of the Constitution and let us take this piece of paper and all of us agree that hereafter we'll do it this way. And in three years, you'd have tremendous results. So I, I ask you, especially brethren, you are accountants, you are lawyers, you are businessmen, you are tax experts. Have we worked out the answers? We have a vacuum in our priesthood culture that we've never filled. And that's preparing ourselves for the day when they turn and lean upon us as a staff. So, with just that background, let me, let me bring my remarks to a conclusion by just sharing with you now a, a few things that I, I hope will be helpful. Back around 1965, President McKay said, now I definitely want all the saints to begin studying what's happening to our country and what we can do about it. And there was very little attention paid to it. I have the exact quote here. It's rather astonishing. No, nothing happened. The next um, year, 1966, he had one of the apostles speak on the topic, Be ye not commanded in all things, for he that must be commanded in all things is a slothful servant. And that's the 58th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. And all of the excuses people were using for waiting for the church to do these things and so forth, when the priesthood gets a program going, then we'll support it, not before. All of that was dealt with in the General Conference of 1966, and the saints were told that that was not excusable. But nothing happened. Now, I didn't blame anybody because I looked into my own heart. I knew what the conspiracy was doing to the nation. That had been my professional career to keep, back, to keep track of the brownie points that the enemy was chalking up. And it was, uh, it was frightening when you really knew what was going on. And when some of the foremost agents of the enemy were in, in cabinet officers' positions, uh, serving as functionaries in the White House and serving on committees of the Congress and dominating the policy of the State Department and abandoning our allies and the people that were depending upon us to defend the freedom of the world. I knew that part of it, but I didn't know where to start to begin untangling this terribly gnarled string. Anyway, in 1967, I was asked to go back to BYU, and President McKay said, when you get down there, start those young people studying the Constitution. And I thought he meant that now the BYU was going to uh, start a program studying the Constitution. I was thrilled with that, and I've been happy to participate. And I said, now if the church gets back of this president, it will, that will be tremendous. No, 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 he said. It can't be done in the name of the church, nor even the church agency. All the church can do is provide leadership from among its people. This must be a spontaneous movement for every faith and denomination. It must come up from the roots of all the people. And I said, well, President, what do you propose that we do? He said, just start. The way will be opened up. So you start. How many attorneys do we have in the audience? How many attorneys? How many have studied law? Won't anybody admit it? <laughs> <clears throat> well, I'm sure there are two or three of us here. I just wanted them to confirm, uh, if, if they could honestly do so, that at least my worst course in law school was constitutional law. My very worst course was worse than real property. And that's pretty bad. What was wrong with it? Well, you start out here with the doctrine of the Founding Fathers, and that seems so simple, it's like 2 plus 2 equals 4. Then you go through the Marshall Doctrine, which is pretty easy to understand. You get into the Taney Doctrine. He developed, a lot of doctrines developed after Taney, up to about 1895. And then you get a lot of different doctrines, about 1905, 1908. Then you start moving over to some amendments to the Constitution. Then you get finally over into the Warren um, 
uh, you get the gold cases and the Social Security cases, and then you, you get Justice Roberts in 1936 on that general welfare. And by the time, this time your brain is just gyrating. And then you get over into the Warren Doctrine, and finally you get over into the Burger Doctrine, and by this time it's hamburger. Uh, you just, you, if you're really trying to be a conscientious philosophical student of precepts, it defies comprehension. And yet you must be able to argue those doctrines in the court. So I was awfully glad to get out of constitutional law. Now the prophet of the Lord says we must start teaching the Constitution. Where do you start? So we took about, oh, it's taken nearly eight years, working a little bit at it and walking away, studying Corwin from beginning to end, the classical authority on the subject, putting it together, taking it apart, putting it... Finally, you know what we ended up with? The pure, pristine doctrine of the Founding Fathers. We just cut off everything after the Founding Fathers presented what the Lord said, anything that is more or less than this is evil. And so this spring we began teaching it. Now I know the, the prophet wanted all of us to do this. And when he said go down and start getting the young people to study the Constitution, that wasn't just an exclusive mandate to me. He'd given that to every member of the church. And I was kind of waiting for everybody else to do it. But uh, anyway, we, we started it. We, and, and we called it, uh, we thought it'd be nice to call them uh, Freeman. Freeman. Everybody wants to, every once in a while someone comes up and says, Brother Skousen, who's Mr. Freeman that started this institute? And I said, well, hopefully you. All of us Freeman. You see, that's what the Founding Fathers said. They didn't call themselves Americans. They, they talked about the ancient rights of Freeman. That's what Moroni called his men, do you remember? The Freeman versus the um, King men? In any event, we just started out. We had to put it under some kind of a name. That's the way we started it out. Well, it's been kind of thrilling what's happening. Now, the most important thing about Joseph Smith's prophecy to me is the fact that he said, and this people shall bear the Constitution away from the brink of destruction. And that's, that just puts fire in my bones. We can't do that today. What if the country turned to, this, to the saints today and said, now you're nice people, lead out. Any volunteers? I want to tell you these are highly technical problems and they must be worked out uh, and phased out so gently and carefully it will have to be almost an art so that there isn't a terrible rocking of the boat and a losing of confidence in the process. That's got to be worked out tactically as well as philosophically. Now that's our task and it's right on us. And it's only one of many tasks that I say to, to those that I've talked to in the past, watch the spirit. Your calling may be genealogy, working with the youth, uh, governing a ward, governing a stake. The Lord knows where he has each of his servants performing their task. Watch the Spirit. And if the Spirit touches you when you hear the message of freedom and the restoration of the Constitution, then don't let that flame die. But if your calling is elsewhere, so be it. We've got to keep the whole kingdom going. We don't focus on just one thing. In fact, that's the genius of the church. I used to go to general conference and there was one man that every time he'd stand up, I knew what he was going to talk about. I knew it was going to be Indians. No doubt about it. It would be the Indians. And you know who I'm talking about. And the prophet had given him the assignment to develop an Indian program. And I'll tell you, he didn't have cooperation. He had some resistance in circles he shouldn't have been resisted. But he gradually worked it up into the finest Indian program that exists anywhere in this country. And the largest contingent of Indian students that are in any major university are at the Brigham Young University now. There was another man, every time he'd stand up, that was Brother Kimball, of course, you knew that. There was another man, you're going to stand up, every time he stood up, I knew what we were going to get. It's welfare, welfare, no doubt about it, it's welfare. And uh, that's President Harold B. Lee. And why not? When the brethren were told, all the state presidents were told during the Depression, they couldn't allow any of their people to starve. If they did, it was on the head of the state president. And President Lee just called his bishops in and gave them the same message. <laughs> if anybody starves in your ward, it's your responsibility. So they all got busy. They developed a program. The Spirit of the Lord said to the First Presidency, that's the way to go. 
And so that's the way we went. And Harold B. Lee then was brought into the general authorities, and the, we, we developed the finest welfare program that exists, and it still isn't perfect, but we're on the way. Genealogy, fantastic. That dead subject. People, uh, <laughs> we had a general authority, every time he'd stand up, I knew we were going to hear that subject, and uh, at, at that time it was very boring to me. But because he did what the prophet told him to do, he held on to his stewardship and developed the world's greatest genealogical repository that exists in the world. Even the Soviet Union sent a delegation to our last great world conference held here in Salt Lake City. Now, there was a time when we didn't have a primary. There was a time when we didn't have a Sunday school. There was a time when we didn't even have a Relief Society. It's hard to think back that far, but there was a time. And there was a time when we didn't have apostles, and we didn't have seventies. All these things have been added to the kingdom as we have rounded out the grandeur and beauty of the kingdom of God. And now we have a big, huge vacuum staring us right in the face called constitutional principle. That we, as a body, have got to provide initiative in preparing. Well. Brother Wiseman has been on my doorstep ever since we started teaching, first in Ogden, then in Provo, then in Logan, Idaho Falls, Pocatello. He said, what's wrong with Bountiful? <laughs> I said, everything's wonderful out in Bountiful. He said, we want to get one started out in our area. So he's made the arrangements so that we will start one. It will be in November, and the only night that our faculty are available, so it, it can't include any young people this time, but it will later, it has to be on a Tuesday night. So we're going to start it. We can, as I say, we can only accommodate a hundred. When we set up this seminar, I told the people who came in with me as leaders. We had given half of our family income to the program to get it started. I said to these men, if you want to be leaders in this program, you have to be a contributor. There are no salaries. We pay a modest income to those who work for us full time, but that's all. All the leaders have to be contributors. We keep a spirit of sacrifice in, in this program. We don't, start, uh, we don't talk about ourselves anymore as belonging to this faction or that faction. We just talk about how could you save the Constitution. In one of our seminars, a little to the north, we have the, the chairman of the Democratic Party sitting next to the chairman of the Republican Party at the seminar. And both of them saying, that's right, we've got to do it. See, that's, that's what the Constitution will do for, for people. And that's the way it ought to be. We ought to have every party working for the Constitution. We shouldn't have pro-Constitution and anti-Constitution uh, represent. All parties should say, I can do it better than the other party. That's really what it ought to be about. So in any event, that's the way we've set it up. Now, if you've got another piece of paper, don't use that one. I'm hopeful you'll, you'll uh, hand that one in so that we can at least keep you advised. If you've got another little piece of paper, let me give you the prophecies as I come to a close that are in the Book of Mormon about this land and the things that we have to achieve. Now, I want to do this quickly now so we won't hold you beyond the hour. You hear these prophecies cited all the time and it's just nice to have them at your fingertips. If you've got your, um, your scriptures with you, it's nice to put it on a blank page in the back. These are prophecies concerning America. All right, the first one is 1 Nephi 13 and 30. 1 Nephi 13 and 30. The United States to be above all other nations. Now I want to tell you in, in 1830 that was a fantastic thing to come out with when we had this little uh, uh, puckish uh, group of Yankees and, and uh, Southerners over there on the Atlantic seaboard to say that they were going to be the greatest nation on the face of the earth. How, how do you think that sounded to France and England? A little presumptuous? You see, you take it for granted, so do I. All right, the next one is 2 Nephi 1 and 5. This land is choice above all of the lands. The resources are here. You have no idea what resources are here. Neither do I. I just know the prophets have said they're much more extensive than we know. We're walking on oil shale that we've got to learn how to extract because it will last the United States 500 years without getting any from anywhere if we can just learn how to get it out at the present rate of consumption, that is. There are all other, other kind of resources. I have a couple of friends that are sitting on uh, something that if uh, it turns out to be as real, as real as it appears to be in theory, it will revolutionize the whole uh, uh, 
uh, energy problem. In any event, this land is a choice land, and it was prepared so that we won't run out of resources. We don't have to have abortions and restricted population at all. The earth is full, and there's an abundance thereof for big families of well-nurtured, educated young people to be raised by hundreds and hundreds of millions more than we have now. Now, and the next one is, this land is a land of inheritance exclusively for the seed of Lehi and the Gentiles who will serve God, and nobody else has a promised inheritance here. Second Nephi 1 and 5, those who have an, an inheritance in this land are a, a very special people. Now, the Lord said that this land will never be brought down into captivity by outside attack. That's 2 Nephi 1 and 7. Never to be brought down into captivity. Now you're going to be very grateful for that because these same people that wanted to have a heart for the poor wanted to have a heart for our enemy. And so during World War II they gave them all of our plans for the atomic bomb and one half of our uranium salts. And they, got, they, they were able to put it together and explode one in about three or four years after they got it. Put them about, they would have, it would have taken them at least 25 years otherwise. But in any event, we have restricted our defenses of our nation until we are now a second-rate military nation. And this is admitted now by all the authorities, both political and military, on the assumption that you can trust the enemy under detente. Contrary to what our prophet has said, what Joseph Smith said, what George Washington said, there will be a pit dug for these people, the Book of Mormon says, and it will be a big pit in which we could be buried. But you're going to be so grateful for that prophecy because at a time when it is obvious they could destroy us and are getting ready to do it, and men's hearts fail them for fear, you who have a testimony of the Book of Mormon will stand steady will not to lose your sense of um, balance and so forth because you will know that it won't come about. The pit will be filled, but the Book of Mormon says with themselves. They'll start fighting among themselves. Then the Book of Mormon turns around and says, but of course, America could dig a pit for itself, but it will be dug inside. The great threat to America is internal, not external. Not that there aren't, is an external threat, God can take care of that one, but he will not violate the free agency of the people. And if this people dig their own pit internally, they can fall into it. Now, we came very close to doing that. Uh, as a matter of fact, let me go on to several other prophecies that relate to it. This land is designated a land of liberty for the Gentiles. That's 2 Nephi 10 and 11. It's a land of liberty for the Gentiles. And no kings would gain a permanent foothold here, that verse, same verse says. And the Lord will fortify it against all other nations. Now, the Lord then said, If those Gentiles will not allow my gospel to be restored among them, then I will wipe them off the face of the land as completely as the earlier civilizations of the Jaredites and the Nephites. And I will do it with my remnant of Jacob that will be living on the land. Who's the remnant of Jacob? Mexico, Central America, and Western South America, where the seed of Lehi are. And the Lord said they would rise up like a lion that would go among the sheep as, as Micah the prophet had promised, and they will absolutely devastate this nation at a time when it's engaged in civil war and unable to defend itself. But the Lord says, if the gospel is allowed to be restored among the Gentiles, if they'll let me do my work and set up my great establishment, then I will restrain the remnant of Jacob so that he will not have the power to go through and destroy. Now, has, is that prophecy fulfilled? At least once it is. By a very narrow squeak, the gospel got restored. They killed the prophet. And they chased the saints out of the continental United States at that time, and we brought the flag with us, so that worked out all right. And uh, eventually, the, the, the saints were tolerated. In fact, in many cases, embraced. We have one of the most marvelous opportunities to do good among these wonderful uh, neighbors of ours because they've got Israelite blood in them. They just don't know it, as we didn't know it until we were converted and got a patriarchal blessing. But as I speak among these, these wonderful people of this land, they're not... 
uh, as degenerate, perverted, and so forth as one might think. Uh, I spoke to about 15 uh, audiences of high school students last summer, and it just thrilled me as I watched these young Baptists uh, down in Texas stand up, and uh, about 500 high school students, the leaders of their various high schools, well-dressed, well-groomed, and I would hear them say, we must maintain the image of Christ. And we must get our students to uh, agree with us that it's desirable to avoid drugs, to be morally clean. I thought I was in an MIA conference. <laughs> and the same thing happened up in North Dakota. The same thing happened in Minnesota. I'll tell you, this land is just filled with beautiful people waiting for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so President um, Lee, just before his death, said, Now, I know a lot of you have uh, been reading the doomsday prophecies. But they don't have to come to pass. Not if we throw enough in the eternal prophetic computer to turn the tide. We can save this nation. And he says, I promise you, in the name of the Lord, it can be done. Now stop being pessimistic. You know, a lot of our people want to take their two-year supply and go up in the hills and sit this one out. No, we're, <laughs> we're, supposed to, we're supposed to stay in here. We're to be an influence for good. That's our whole purpose. All right, now, it says... If the Gentiles will tolerate this work, then it will be, uh, it will be allowed to remain established. Now, I, I need to go back here. The one on the destruction of the Gentiles uh, is by the Savior himself. He, he said, I'm quoting Micah. Well, that was, Micah was after the Nephites got over here, so he had to quote it so they'd know what it said. Third Nephi 20 and 15. Third Nephi 20 and 15, which is where it says we'll be destroyed. And the one that says... Um, that Jacob will be, the remnant of Jacob will be held back is 3 Nephi 16 and 14. So we're quite a way down the prophetic trail now. Now there's a tremendous warning in the um, book of Ether and we close on that because this is what's happening and a lot of people have been reluctant to accept it or admit it but it's so real. Every congressional committee has found it. In the FBI we saw it and it's just as ugly as Moroni says it is. And it must be understood, it must be resisted, and it must be resisted intelligently. And we must be united in order to resist it. So listen to what Moroni said. In one place he said, you Gentiles, I've seen your day. Now he knew that we Gentiles of the latter days would be Ephraimites or would be of Israel, but we wouldn't know ourselves. We would come out of the Gentiles, we would behave like Gentiles, etc. And our ancestors did. And we've been called out from the world now to play our role as Israelites. But we came out from among the Gentiles. So he addresses us as Gentiles. And he says, now you Gentiles, this is the 8th chapter beginning with the 22nd and 23rd verse. He said, I've seen your day. And I have now told you about the destruction of the Jaredites. And I've told you about the destruction of my own people. And it was from the same cause, a great internal secret combination of our own people out to seek power and gain, who exploited our people and deceived our people and put them under satanical oaths to the point where murder became the ultimate device of compulsion. Now he says, Wherefore, O ye Gentiles, it is wisdom in God that these things should be shown unto you, that thereby ye may repent. Repent of what? Repent of ignoring it, saying it didn't exist. As I say to some of my friends with PhD degrees, why would you deny what the Lord himself revealed to his prophet is here? Well, because I just don't believe that theory. Do you believe prophecy? Well, yes. <laughs> All right. It says repent and suffer not that these murderous combinations shall get above you, which are built up to get power and gain. You see, Mao Zedong boasts of having slaughtered over 30 million of his own people, and we understand it was closer to 60 million. Can you imagine sitting at the dinner table with this kind of a man and trying to work out a long-range program for peace, happiness, and prosperity, and trusting the security of the, of the American people to this kind of a person? Suffer not that these murderous powers shall get above you. And then it says in the 24th verse, Wherefore the Lord commandeth you, when ye shall see these things come among you, that ye shall awake to a sense of your awful situation, because of this secret combination which shall be among you. For woe be unto it because of the blood of them which have been slain. 
for they cry from the dust for vengeance. It's as though he's saying there, if you don't do it while you can, the blood of your own children will cry out against you from the ground for not having done something while you could. For it cometh to pass that whoso buildeth it up seeketh to overthrow the freedom of all lands, nations, kindreds, and people, and bring to pass the destruction of all people. For it is built up by the devil, who is the father of all lies. Now he says, this is revealed unto you so that you can do something about it when it happens. Every congressional committee that looked for it found it. And anyone who wants to do the, just the slightest amount of reading will see that it's there. Now it's actually more than one combination. It functions in almost every dimension of our society, each one with his own satanical aspirations. But they cooperate with each other. In the FBI, I used to watch the gangsters come out of New Jersey. They could go up to Mickey Cohen in Los Angeles and say, I belong to the, uh, the Schultz gang, etc. I just want to cool off here for a little while. He, perfect stranger, he'd take him right in, give him an apartment, take care of him, keep him hidden out. They do that. Here's a secret combination in New Jersey and, and one over here in California taking care. They have a common mind. Now that's, the word conspiracy means breathing together. And that's what they do. They breathe together. <clears throat> Not such good breath either. <laughs> now, brothers and sisters, I so appreciate your wonderful patience in hearing me out. out. I haven't said anything new tonight. I've only said what J. Reuben Clark pleaded with my generation to listen to. I've only said what uh, President McKay said over and over again. I've only said what the Founding Fathers tried to get us to believe in. And it may, may even seem a little trite, but to me it's exciting since we heard, the, since we gained this prophecy of the prophet Joseph Smith, which said this people will be leaned upon as a staff and they will bear the Constitution away from the brink of ruin. Now some of you might want to start constitutional seminars of your own. Go ahead, do it. Nothing exclusive about this. If you want to join us in what we're trying to do to, to serve... Uh, this important purpose, you're welcome to come with us. There's nothing exclusive about it. And uh, I'm just so grateful that that spirit is beginning to move among our people. I'm getting in all kinds of trouble with California from which I just returned. They said, what's the matter with us? I said, nothing's wrong with you. Why? Why don't we get seminars down here? I said, go ahead and start them. We don't know where to begin. I said, well, I'll admit it's a little baffling, but if you want to wait on us, we'll be here next year. But we're going to work on Idaho, Utah, and the Intermountain Country first. We'll be down here next year. This gospel is true. We've got prophets at the head of the church. We've got men warning us. They have warned us and warned us and warned us. They've told us what to do about debts. They've told us what to do about our homes. They've told us to do what about our children, our tithing, our fast offerings, our health. They've told us how to run our businesses intelligently, honest, honestly, in a forthright manner. They've told us to gather together on occasions of worship and so forth in order that we might remain united and listen to our leaders and support them, respond to the call of service. We are part of God's latter-day kingdom. That's my testimony. I love this gospel. I'm so grateful to be alive today. So appreciate President Davis and all of you state presidents who made this thrilling experience possible for me tonight. This gives me great encouragement. I know this same spirit is moving among a lot of people. I wonder if I could just close for the third time <laughs> with this final little experience. This summer I was just finishing a certain section of our text on the Constitution and do you know that all of the principles, the institutes of freedom on which our Constitution was based came out of the Anglo-Saxon common law? And did you know that the Anglo-Saxon common law has now been traced back to the institutes of freedom that came out of ancient Israel? And we can demonstrate it and document it? I'll tell you it's exciting. And if I'd had time tonight, and you wouldn't want me to close a fourth time, but I'd give you four or five of those, but it's sufficient to say that that's something we can document. Now, I read that in the Congressional Library just strumming through the stacks one day, and I thought, now, I'm going to come back and read that sometime. I never got back. I remembered it, and here I am writing a text, and I need that material. I can't remember the books. I don't think I took any notes on it, so I start researching. I can't find anything that relates to it topically. I'm lost. I spent, I wasted one whole month 
at a time when I was in tremendous pressure trying to get the text rounded out and refined and one night I received a call. It's uh, from a first generation German. That's obvious from the call. He said, Brother Skousen, <laughs> when can I see you? And I said, who is this? He said, this is Albert Schmuel. I said, what did you want to see me about? He said, I don't know. <laughs> and I get some strange calls sometimes. <laughs> I said, well, you had, must have had some reason for seeing me. He said, yes, it's very important. <laughs> but I said, you won't, wouldn't care to discuss it over the phone. Why you want to see me? He said, I will know when I see you. And I somehow felt impressed I should see this man. He's an absolute stranger. I had never heard of him before. Uh, so we set up an appointment and we met. He's a very delightful, dignified person. He sits down and I said to Brother Shmuel, what do you do? He said, I'm a genealogical historian. And in due time he said, what are you doing, Brother Skousen? Before that he had identified himself uh, he said, I'm the one that did the charts for the church, genealogical charts back to Adam. I did all the research for that, the four lines that go back to Adam. I did that. Oh, I said, I've seen your charts. I didn't know who, who you were. Yes, he said, I'm Albert Schmuel. And, <clears throat> so I said, that's nice, and I'm happy to know you. Now he said, Brother Scott, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm trying to write a book, and I'm having a terribly frustrating experience. He said, what's the problem? I said, I, I have read, I have seen the documentation that traces the common law Anglo-Saxon institutes of freedom right back to ancient Israel and belong to the original covenant institutes before Israel fell. Well, he said, of course. I have the books. <laughs> I said, Brother Shmuel, what have you got? What are the books? And he named them. He had them. Yes, he said, I have a whole library on this. It's very well established. Oh, I said, our text needs this. I need to be able to teach our people that when we talk about common law, the law of the people, we're talking about the law of God. Well, of course, he said. I will bring the books. Oh, I said, I, you've made my day. I can't tell you how grateful I am. He said, let me tell you something else. Why I'm here. I was sitting in the temple. And I gained a strong impression that I should see Brother Skousen. And he said, you didn't know me, I don't know you, I've read a few of your books. But I say, why should I see Brother Skousen? I try to dismiss it from my mind. I get into the terrestrial room and it comes even stronger. You must see Brother Skousen. So I got dressed, I called you on the phone and asked if I could see you. And you asked me why, and of course I don't know. <laughs> But he said, now I know, and you know. I said, it's wonderful, Brother Schmuel. It's thrilling. Of course, he said. And he gave me the books. And in our text, it's documented now. You can put confidence in the common law that Brother Clark talks about so much because it came originally by direct revelation from God. And no wonder the Lord, in having the Founding Fathers crystallize it, synthesize it, and bring it together in its galvanized form, was able to say this is it and anything that's more or less than this is evil. This is my law for men under these circumstances and in this set time. Well that was thrilling and after Brother Schmuel was gone I said to my wife this is a lot bigger than we are and that's just the way I feel about it. So I'm grateful for your patience in hearing me out as I share some of these thoughts. Some of us have spent our whole lives, our whole professional lives, waiting for the day when the saints would begin to respond to the call of the prophets to fill this vacuum. And I'm happy to see the day when that spirit's beginning to move among thousands of the saints. They feel the need. And as President McKay told several of us in 1960, history will catch up with our good people and many of them who don't really understand all the ramifications and theories, etc., will turn and lend their strength to preserving the Constitution because history will have taught them it's the right thing to do. God bless you, my brothers and sisters, everyone. We're engaged in the work of God, whatever we're doing in the kingdom, and we all have different callings. 
But I pray that we all may succeed, that the kingdom may be rounded out and strengthened and firmed up in all its ramifications, that each of us must be, may be blessed and do well in our families and in our tasks at home and in our professions. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.